Grace to you all this morning and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. The reading of the gospel is almost enough this morning. It's such a wonderful, wonderful gospel passage. It happens on the first day of the week, that first Easter. Jesus has risen from the tomb that morning, met Mary Magdalene, and now later in the evening he comes to the, to the disciples in the locked room, though two of them, Peter and the unnamed disciple, have seen indications of the resurrection. They haven't quite put it together just yet. But now, as Jesus appears to them in the upper room, um, it all makes sense to them, despite the fact that it, it makes no sense, right? That, that things are suddenly in a different order of things. Just, I just love this passage. So much there that you could just ponder on. Take it home, read it throughout the week, start your day with it, and think about maybe what it says to you. A quote from um, an ancient, either an ancient Greek playwright or a U.S. senator or both. The first, truth is the first casualty in war. And we might amend that in our day to say that uh, truth is the first casualty in war and presidential campaigns. Truth is the first casualty. You will perhaps call to mind that famous conversation when Pontius Pilate is interrogating Jesus, um, either in an effort to get him uh, released on some grounds or just to anger those who want Jesus crucified, where he asks Jesus what his mission is, what his purpose is, what his goal is, what his intentions are, and Jesus says to Pilate quite simply, for this I came, and that is to witness to the truth to witness to the truth. And Pilate's response, and we'll remember right away that Pilate is a politician, Pilate's response is, what is truth? What is truth? It's a good question for people to ask, what is truth? But the, the um, intention behind it makes all the difference, doesn't it? Is there cynicism there? What is truth? Like there is no truth, or is Pilate looking for the, the very essence of truth that will give his life and his work meaning and purpose? What is truth? seems to me that in our time, that's an even more critical question. What is truth? I was reading um, in one of my favorite magazines the other day. No comment. <laughs> Outside magazine. Lovely magazine. <laughs> Zoom in. <laughs> Please. Subscription information on the <laughs> scroll underneath. There was a review in this magazine on um, three books about how you can enhance your athletic performance by mindfulness. Mindfulness. And the reviewer writes this paragraph that caught my attention. Um, one author named Mumford um, has an extended discussion of Zen Buddhism's role in athletic performance. Mumford deployed this approach himself with Phil Jackson and the Chicago Bulls, among others, and he got impressive results. But while the book The Mindful Athlete is rich in discussion, it's thin on science, which is, after all, the source of the new wisdom. That's the sentence that caught my attention. Which is, after all, the source of the new wisdom. Science is the source of the new wisdom. And being a bit of a cynic myself, and just a bit of a one, <clears throat> I read that sentence and I thought to myself, science, which also proves that mindfulness enhances athletic performance. The Zen Buddhists would be so happy to know that their practice of meditation and mindfulness is actually scientifically grounded. Don't you think they'd be thrilled to know that? Don't you think their meditation practice might be even better now that they know it's grounded in science? I'm thinking, no, right? For thousands of years, Buddhists have been practicing Zen meditation and found an enhancement of their in intentions and their enjoyment of life, um, and they didn't need science to prove that to them. Why not? Because their own personal experience proved it to them. And then science just, science just becomes a kind of a, well, nice to know, but it doesn't make a difference, really. 
Since the Enlightenment, however, which I believe the reviewer of this article is a product of, since the Enlightenment, science is the new wisdom. If you can prove it scientifically by empirical method, then it, no matter what the it is, must be true. That's what truth is. So you can say anything that you want, but unless it can be proven scientifically, it is not necessarily truth. That's kind of the mindset that many people bring to their experience of life and to their definition of truth. Well, prove it to me, we say. Prove it to me. I want absolute concrete proof of the reality of what you're telling me. Well, this is nothing new. We encounter the same kind of approach to truth in this morning's reading from John's Gospel, where Thomas, who is not with the other disciples, ten in number since Judas is no longer among them, and others in the upper room on that first Easter, when he's not with them and they come to tell him, we have seen the Lord, Thomas says, prove it to me. I'm not just taking your word for it, and I'm not even going to take my own word for it, Thomas says. I want empirical proof. I want to be able to see Jesus, and then not just see him, but place my finger in the wound in his hands and put my hand in his side, and then, with such proof, I will believe. Then I'll know that it's true. Thomas could have been the reviewer of this article, right? Science is the new wisdom. I want science. Well, a lot of us want that. Except there are certain realms of life where science not only doesn't help us necessarily to know what is truth, but perhaps even makes that truth something a lot less exciting, interesting, and meaningful. For instance, if I told you that your ability to form relationships has a lot to do with centers in your brain, and those brain centers releasing particular hormones at the encounter with another person, does it make love that much more wonderful to know this information? Or does it kind of make it a little bit like, wow, I thought it was much more mystical and, and miraculous than that, but it's really all just science, or is it? Especially for those of us gathered here together this morning, and for those of you who are watching this video later on YouTube, we want to know that life has much more of, of a miraculous, mystical, meaningful edge to it, and it can't all be boiled down to simple scientific processes. That truth actually has many dimensions to it. Some of them are scientific, and some of them are a little bit different, comprehended, apprehended with a different part of who we are. When Thomas says to the disciples, I want scientific proof, nothing, I'm guessing, changed their minds about what they had seen that night in the closed room. Though they could not produce a selfie of themselves standing there with the resurrected Christ, they still believed it to be true. Though those who were more skeptical in the culture around them would have wanted to have them committed to an, an asylum for those not quite with it, the disciples would have gone and in fact did go to their graves believing that the one they encountered that Easter evening was the risen Christ who had overcome death. And for them, that was truth unshakable. Could someone have approached them and produced scientific proof that this couldn't possibly happen, they wouldn't have changed their minds at all. For the truth that they found was a truth based on experience and conviction, a truth that went for them beyond science, beyond reason. So we see here in this brief passage in John's Gospel a kind of a conflict between empirical truth, which Thomas represents, and what we might call spiritual wisdom. That God, who created everything that is, 
can break out of the box of empirical truth anytime God wants to. But, thankfully, God doesn't do that too often. Or you might wake up one morning and God decided to do away with the laws of gravity, and then where would we all be? There's a structure to the universe and to our existence, but God feels completely free to break into that structure with something new and different and radical, which we also experience as truth. What worries me about an article such as this is when we give all the credibility and responsibility to one kind of truth at the exclusion of the other. Our lives are really made up of understanding two different kinds of truth which are complementary to one another, empirical truth and spiritual truth. And of course, you're not surprised to know that the scriptures, especially our resurrection appearance gospels, lean heavily on that experiential truth. As I mentioned last week, just the empty tomb was no proof of the resurrected Christ. Rather, the transformed lives of those followers of Jesus and others throughout the centuries since who have experienced the truth of Jesus' presence, of the new reality, is proof of the resurrection in ways that science has very little to say about. Because perhaps faith is not necessarily or exclusively the realm of empirical science. I tell you all of this because many people in our world today have no belief in the resurrection whatsoever, which is where they're coming from. But they may well ask, well, where's the proof? Show me the evidence. And we can't produce that evidence in terms of empirical proof, but we certainly can produce that evidence in terms of our own transformed lives. Think about Thomas again for just a moment. He often gets a bum rap. He gets this miserable nickname, right? Doubting Thomas. Why don't we just call him Cynical Thomas, or Skeptical Thomas, or Show Me Thomas? But when he does come back into that upper room a week later, perhaps you notice this. Jesus appears to the disciples again, singles out Thomas from the group, says to him, Thomas, do everything you want to do to have the empirical proof you're looking for that I am, in fact, risen from the dead. Put your finger in the mark of the nails in my hand. Put your hand in my side. Don't doubt. Believe. And there seems to be a little break in the story there, a little emptiness, a little hole. The gospel writer doesn't tell us exactly what Thomas does. By implication, Thomas does nothing, does not put his finger into the mark of the nail, does not put his hand in Jesus' side, rather confronted with Jesus standing there before him, he is moved to make what is the greatest declaration of the truth of who this Jesus is of anyone anywhere else in the Gospels. Because Thomas, on being confronted with the risen Christ, proclaims, my Lord and my God. My God. Thomas is the one who recognizes that Jesus is, in fact, God in the flesh and the one to whom he owes everything that he has. The implication of the title, my Lord and my God. Thomas got proof, but the proof was in his heart. It was in his mind. It was in his life. It was a wisdom born of faith. It was a different kind of proof, but one that motivated him the deep self-giving for the sake of this truth. In fact, according to legend, Thomas, in the dispersal of the faithful from Jerusalem, went to India and there founded the church, which is still in some places called Thomas's Church, 
and the reason that so many people of Indian descent have the last name Thomas. Because that apostle went and brought the good news of Christ to the people of India. A transformed life because he believed in the truth of what he saw, of what he experienced. Now perhaps your mind is already going to that, those words of Jesus after Thomas makes this declaration in which Jesus says to Thomas, Thomas, do you believe because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And in that little phrase, Jesus encompasses all of us who have not seen with our eyes in the way that Thomas could have done, who have not had the opportunity, perhaps, to do what Thomas asked to do, and yet we come together this morning as believers, as those who have a feeling we know what the truth is, who do know that truth on an experiential level, who share the wisdom of faith, but then the question becomes for us, what does that truth lead you to do in your life of faith? To what is God calling you based on that truth? To what changes, what transformations, what motivations in your life and in the world around you have you seen as proof that the resurrected Christ has in fact had an impact on who you are and how you define yourself and what the future looks like. And I would just remind you that that experiential truth can be individual, but it can also be a communal truth, which is what we celebrate together this morning. We gather because we believe. And when my faith runs a little bit thin, a little bit shaky, it's the faith of the community that upholds and strengthens me. You all affirm the truth for me, that Christ is in fact a resurrected and present Christ. Don't let truth be the casualty in your life of faith. We have the wisdom of our faith that what we proclaim, what we hope for, is in fact true. So Jesus wishes his disciples peace, fearlessness, strength, and promises to be with them always until the end of time. That, alongside many other realities, is truth. 